Hi, everybody. How you doing? Thanks so much for attending. Uh, my name is Matt Hill. I'm going to let everybody get in, get settled. I really appreciate you all showing up today. There's a ton of you out there. Uh, this is really exciting. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for, for coming in and, and joining me today, joining us at NovaFlex uh, to talk about one of my very, 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 very favorite topics, and that's Milky Way panoramas. You know I love night photography. If you know me, I was just out of Joshua Tree. Uh, I was on an incredible three-week trip, and I have a lot of wonderful things to share with you. But first, but first, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please use the chat. Oh, it's over on that side. Please use the chat if you want to talk with each other uh, or amongst each, yourselves. If you have a question, please, please, please use the Q&A. Uh, and I will uh, make sure that we flag those. We have Martin from NovaFlex also here in the chat. Uh, if you have gear questions, chances are he's going to pop in and give you a reply while I'm speaking. You may ask questions anytime. Uh, you can do that in the chat, but we prefer if it's a question you did really want answered to use the Q&A. We will take our time to get to everything we can. Uh, I already see some good stuff going on in here. Um, so... I generally take questions at the end, but if Martin sees something really important, he's going to flag me and let me know uh, that I should probably uh, take a, a gander at what you guys are saying. So uh, please use the chat to say hello and where you're from. We'd love to know that. Uh, we have, gosh, um, we have over 50 people here already, uh, and that's really heartwarming to have you here. I appreciate it. So, all right. Without further ado, I'm going to get right into it because we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So uh, we are going to focus on, pun fully intended, making Milky Way panoramic photos. And you knew that because you came here. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying um, a lot of people don't ask why, why panos, but I'm going to address that right off the bat. Um, if you make a panorama, you might be seeking any of the following or a combination of them. One, much higher resolution output. Uh, some cameras have, a, and it, all cameras have a certain resolution, right? But when you make a pano, that resolution becomes all of the images put together. So you can have a greater resolution. Uh, if you try and take one image, you can't cover the whole area that you want to do. That's, that's where panos were born, right? So you can cover a panorama. Um, if the, uh, the subject is warping at the edges, you might want to take multiple images to reduce the warping, right? You might like that pano aspect ratio, which can mean many things, but traditionally it's one to three or three to one. Um, if you're doing what I do, taking pictures of the Milky Way, the Milky Way gets up pretty tall as the night goes on. And as the summer becomes longer, it gets up taller and taller in the atmosphere. So you might need to take multiple pictures to get that in your frame with the landscape. And I just want to be clear, I'm not a straight astro photographer. I'm an astro landscape photographer. Some people call it nightscaping. We call it astro landscape. Uh, and then the focal lengths that you own might not cover the area that you want. So this is an, an ideal way to get all of the things you want in frame. Maybe you want more depth of field, and we're going to cover that later. And this is the best one. If you want to make massive prints, panos are a great way to make sure that you have all the resolution you need to get in there. So, all right, so let's cover some common terms first. So the first things, uh, the first thing, I just saw a chat question in there about popping. I think that my sound is good. Uh, give me a shout if you don't think it is. So let's talk about this. Just to get the, the common terms out there, a panorama is a horizontal series of stitched images. That means you take multiple images and use software to stitch them together. A mosaic is when you take many, many pictures, but in multiple rows. So you can take, let's say, eight across and then go down or up a little bit and take another row across. And you can do this multiple times, three rows, two rows, four rows. And then you stitch all of them together. And then there's a vertorama, which is just a panorama on its side. It's a panorama that goes up instead of side to side. Uh, so I just wanted to get those out there ahead of time so that I don't confuse you later on with terms. This first image I'm going to show you is not a panorama. This is a single image. It's one shot with a 15 millimeter lens at the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And although it's beautiful and it's a wonderful moment, when you really get down into it, the resolution doesn't do the Grand Canyon 
the the doesn't give it the do that it should. Uh, so uh, what I did was I took a second uh, pano image and I focused on just this area, and I did a six by three mosaic at seventy millimeters instead of a single image at fifteen millimeters. And here's what happened. So this image now this is not night photography. I'm just establishing the the ground here. Uh, I like to practice during the day, and I'm going to repeat that over and over during this. So at 70 millimeters with the camera vertical instead of horizontal, I can make six across by three up and down to make all of these images. And when you jump into 100% on the left is the six by three mosaic. On the right is the single 15 millimeter image. So just saying on pure resolution alone, it's worth the effort if you want to see all the details that you want to see. So since we're here to talk about Milky Way panoramas, I wanted to talk to you about the best times of year to shoot a Milky Way. Right now, right now, but let's get into details. Um, you should be able to pre-visualize your location uh, using apps. You should be able to look at this ahead of time and not necessarily be there also. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of photo pills. There's a ton of free education on photo pills on National Parks at Night and Photo Pills website. Um, but I use photo pills. There's other apps like Stellarium or Planet Pro or the Photographer's Ephemeris. They all can help you plan to know where the Milky Way will be and at what time it's advantageous. On the right hand side of my screen here, you could see, uh, and I'm just going to draw on it a little bit, you could see that the core is right there and that it's going to be coming through this scene like that. And you can also see that the time of day that it's supposed to be up at the top, and that would be 11.15 p.m. So that is very helpful information to me to know that that's going to happen then. And then down on the bottom, this one's 10.13 p.m., that the core is just coming up off the horizon. And this information we use all the time to figure out when what most people consider to be the most important part of the Milky Way, the galactic core, is above the horizon because it's got the most detail. It's got the dusk channels and all the beautiful stuff in there. You can choose your time and dates there. Uh, this is just another example here. Uh, let's see. I'm making sure I can see all this stuff here. Okay. So on the right-hand side, I was out in white pocket. This is the beginning and the end of a pano. Over here is where the pano is tailing in. And over here is where the core is coming up. And this is the holy grail when you're looking at Milky Way pano photography. You could see, if I undo this stuff, that this is to the north and to this is to the southeast. So I need to cover this entire range in my pano. And I did it by daytime scouting with the night AR or augmented reality mode in photo pills. Uh, a lot of the other apps have that also. I just have it for photo pills. Um, and you can pretend that you're there by dropping a pin on the location you plan to go to and then opening up the night AR and do the same thing. It'll just be where you're at instead, but you can sort of get an idea of where the horizon is and where it's going to arc around you. So this is the result of that image, uh, of that planning that I did. This is an 11 frame wide single row pano with an 11 millimeter. So I covered a lot of ground with this one and I definitely aimed for starting here and ending here, but I kept going because I knew that this area was really, really interesting. And I liked, so I overshot this on this side and I overshot it on this side on purpose because I wanted to get this part of the vortex in there and that going down there. And I wanted to have these lines leading everybody around. And I really liked what was going on here. Um, but this was the result of planning. I knew exactly when to come back that night for the Milky Way to be between here and here because I used photo pills ahead of time. Uh, if you want to be more specific about um, when to pan out based on where you are in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, there's the latitude uh, plus 55 to minus 90. It's kind of available February, March to October. Um, June and July have the most Milky Way core, but there's also a, a trade-off. You've got the hottest temperatures and the core is the highest in the sky, right? 
Uh, so that is really important because that decreases your exposure time and adds to the noise that you have. Um, just note, it's not visible November to February. You just, you just can't see it, uh, not the Milky Way core. You can see the Milky Way year round, but the core being the most interesting part, debatably, uh, is out there. And the Southern Hemisphere, I'm not sure where you're all joining us from. Um, you can see it generally from January to October. Uh, and this is latitude plus 55 to minus 90 again. Uh, and then June and July, July also have the most core, but you have the coldest temperatures, which is to your benefit. That means your camera operates better with less noise and the core is highest in the sky. And again, not visible November to, to January. So I have some uh, links that I'm going to pop in the chat for you guys, and I'm just going to pop them in there. Uh, there's some some blog posts that we uh, that we wrote uh, about this at National Parks at Night that can help you guys uh, learn some more about this. Um, yeah, moving on. So there's some other advice that I have for you. Please seek the least possible light pollution. And there's a lot of ways that you can look that up. There's Dark Sky Finder. Uh, there are light pollution maps you can look at in browsers. Um, the Milky Way is more brilliant the less light there is in the sky. And if you can get away from the man-made light, you're in a good place. Uh, the colder, the better, right? Sometimes you can't do that in the Northern Hemisphere. You're shooting during the summer. Uh, but the colder it is, you can go to higher elevations and have it be colder. That can help. And then this is really important. It's because you're doing a panorama, try and pick something with an interesting foreground. Because uh, it's not just the Milky Way arc that you're trying to capture, although technically that might be the first thing that you want to do when you start. Uh, you you have to find some place that's kind of dark. Um, but you need to have something interesting in the front so that you can frame it, that Milky Way core, over something that people want to look at. Something that marries the sky with something on the ground. And the juxtaposition of those two things creates interest, visual interest, stimulation of the mind, all those good things. Now you wanna to aim to shoot on moonless nights. That doesn't necessarily need, mean the new moon. You just need to make sure that you have a few hours of no moon while the core is up that you wanna shoot. You wanna make sure that you're out of twilight, either the beginning or the end of it uh, for the maximum. But twilight can help you uh, illuminate the foreground. So it doesn't strictly have to be dark, but let's start when it's dark. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at the differences between daytime and nighttime panoramic photography, because there are some really important distinctions here. Um, the exposure times are all long exposures. And I, by long, I'm qualifying this, it's over one second, right? Normally we're like eight seconds to 25 seconds, depending on what rule you're using for starports. And we'll talk about that. The ISO is commonly 6400 ISO or higher for the skies. I put an asterisk there because you can use a different ISO for the foreground. The aperture is probably going to be very fast, like 2.8, f2, 1.7. You want to let in as much light as possible to make those stars sparkle to get as much of the dust channels of the Milky Way in there also. Um, you know, so it's also, this might sound obvious, but I have to say it, it's dark. So you need to see what you're looking at. So you need to bring a little dim flashlight to look at your camera. You need to memorize where the settings are. Everything's harder in the dark and it takes longer. In the daytime, you can look at these little markings on it and it's easy. It's like, oh, I can read that. In the dark, you have to pull out a little flashlight. And then your support just really has to be super solid. That's true in the daytime also, but it's especially true at night. When you're open for longer than a second, every vibration will come through to the image. And then lighting. Lighting can get very tricky. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, should I take a single row or a double row? Did I do that right? A single row or a double row? Um, my, my recommendation is this. Let's say I have like over here, I have a 15 millimeter, right? A lot of the time, my 15 millimeter going vertically is enough it'll cover, and I'm gonna show you some more examples of that. My 15 millimeter will cover top to bottom vertically enough of the sky and enough of the ground to tell the story that I want to do, uh, you know? And conversely, if you're shooting horizontally and you can almost get it in this shot, you can just turn it a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right and then take that picture in the center and you will also be able to get a mini panorama that way. Um, 
but you're going to get more coverage if you go vertical, right? So if you can do it in one row, turning your, your camera back and forth like this, go for it. It's a lot less headache to shoot it that way. And we're going to talk about leaving space too. Um, if your subject is close to the top of the frame or the bottom, then you're going to want to tilt and take multiple rows. So you're going to take one shot ang angling up, one at the middle, one down. You'll have to, we'll talk more about that too. If you want to use your subject to appear closer, then you're going to need to use a longer lens and definitely do multiple rows. It's going to make the detail uh, just better. So here's an example. Again, this is after sunset. I know we're not sick with Milky Way here, but I think this is a good example. This is an 11 image wide single row pano shot at 55 millimeters. There's a lot of detail here, so much that I'm going to show you a crop in that you can see over here. There's guys on dune buggies driving around on those dunes, the coral pink sand dunes out near Kanab, Utah. Uh, so, so this is a big single row panorama, but it's kind of hard to see the details. Overall, the colors are very enchanting, right? Uh, but if I wanted to draw attention to those guys in the dune buggies, I chose the wrong aspect ratio. I chose the wrong lens, right? So we'll take a look at another one. This is a 10 image wide single row pano and it's 15 millimeter lens. I got it. I got the Milky Way in here and I got uh, a foreground that's interesting. Uh, but if I wanted to, let's say, put this on Instagram, I'd need to make it a one by three. And then this is cropped one to three. And now it does fit very nicely. I've got the Milky Way inside the goalposts and actually inside the goalposts of, yeah, of this light pollution that you've got all the way around Joshua Tree. Um, but my original image, I find more pleasing and I could probably just crop this down but I like seeing the top of the Milky Way and I like seeing what's down here. So this is going to be cooked to taste on your end. And this is why I recommend shooting during the daytime, because if you wanted a little bit more of that foreground, you'd have to shoot a, a multi-row in this case. Another shot of the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. This is uh, a eight by three pano. Uh, and this one, uh, we went to a lot of uh, great lengths. Where am I here? There we go. This one is a 15 millimeter lens, and I shot three rows. I shot a row for the top, a row in the middle, and a row in the bottom. Uh, and it was really windy out where I was, and I didn't feel quite safe, uh, but I got it done. Uh, but it was necessary to get the detail that we got here. Now, I talked about vertoramas, and I just wanted to, to mention that they're really useful and popular for Milky Way photography uh, because you might have a very tall uh, subject, such as Grosvenor Arch here. Um, you might have a lot of foreground that you want to include. You might want to focus stack, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, or the Milky Way is coming up out of this. Um, or let's say you finish doing a horizontal panorama and you just want another look. You can flip around to do a vertical panorama, a vertorama, and you're going to get this nice look. Um, here's a great example. Um, and when I said focus stacking, this is what I mean. Um, each time I shot one of these frames, it should be on the next one here. Each one of these frames, I focused in the center of the frame as I was tipping up. And this was a what if moment for me. Um, so these these what ended up happening as i stitched this together was it became a focus stack so i got my foreground in focus my mid ground and then i just focus on the stars for the rest of the frames let's say frames five through eight and when they stitched together they ended up being a focus stack in addition to a vertorama uh, so this was a, a wonderful surprise and i wanted to just share that with you guys that uh, you don't have to necessarily do two passes, which we're going to talk about in more detail later. Um, with a vertorama, you can just focus stack like that. And you see how the core, and this was all planning, the core is coming right out of a place that has great visual interest in the scene, this dip in the rocks right here. So it's making this arrow that comes into the scene 
that draws your eyes around in here to all of that detail. And without that detail, it wouldn't be as interesting. If this was soft, it'd be a problem. So let's talk about exposures. Uh, what settings are we going to use? Well, there's there's only three things we've got to work on, right? we got shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. Your shutter speed, you're going to use, I would suggest, the NPF calculation for your exposure duration. That will give you the sharpest stars. You can use the other ones called the 500 rule or the 400 rule, which is what we recommend at NPAN. Um, but the NPF calculation is designed to give you the shortest uh, allowable or the longest allowable shutter duration. Um, on ISO, I'd suggest using an ISO, and I'm going to say that your camera demonstrates having viable quality or sufficient quality. I, during this last trip that I did, was using ISO 12,800 way more than I ever have, but that's because I was making a ton of panoramas. Um, and it surprised me how good the quality was, and I was really excited about that. And then this is this is an interesting one. Um, there I'm with my bad drawing. I would suggest shooting wide open. Um, the wide open is like the fastest your lens can be. Normally, I would be talking to you about stopping down until the coma disappears or the comatic aberration, which makes those little uh, funny planet-shaped stars at the corner of your lens. Um, we'll talk more about why, but I just want you to think about it this way. The more light you let in, uh, and the higher ISO, the more brilliant the stars are going to be, the more brilliant your Milky Way is going to be. And we're just talking about the star field part about this. Um, this is just me doing a 10 by 1, uh, still after dark. We're getting more Milky Way stuff. But this is a 24 millimeter. Um, and yeah, here's PhotoPills. So my settings, and when you look in PhotoPills at spot stars, you're going to see that there's there's two things. There's default and there's accurate. One of them is surprisingly short, and that's default. So for my 15 millimeter lens, that would be 17 seconds, right? Uh, for accurate, that would be 8.3, 8.63 seconds. What's the difference? Accurate is if you want to print something. Look at this. I'm going to write with my cursor, this is so awkward, right? If you want to print something, use accurate, right? For all other reasons, use default, right? Um, in this case, you're going to be creating a really high resolution image. Uh, so you might be able to stick to default. I'm kind of crazy and I'm assuming that I'm going to make lots of prints. So I often use the, the accurate setting and most of the time I use that. Uh, yep. So this is a single shot of the Milky Way coming up. Nice over to the toadstools uh, in northern Arizona, southern Utah. So this is not a pano. It's just an 11 millimeter lens. And it's a great example of when one shot can get it in. I've got the core peaking up. If I wait a little bit longer, the core is going to sneak up over this way. And it's going to arc this way. And... That's what I waited for. In fact, we went back down this path and shot something else, and then we came back up here, and then we shot this. Uh, so this is nine images left to right. And I made two passes, but I didn't move the camera up or down. I did not change its orientation this way. I just kept it the same, and I'll tell you why. Uh, one of them... Oh, well, let's just talk about this first. So the single shot we have here, this is 100% crop. Nice detail. It's I've got focus on the, the subject and the stars. I managed to get focus on both. And then the pano blend that I have, this is 100% crop. You'll see that there is good detail here and here, right? And there's good detail here and here. Fantastic. But this has a higher resolution uh, because I'm adding more pictures together. Now... I focused those two rows. I did two different rows for a reason. One, I focused on the foreground. You'll see it's nice and sharp here. And then the other one, I focused on the sky. And you'll see this is terribly sharp or unsharp. So that's eh, right? But this is because I'm going to blend them later. And then this, this is the foreground. No good for the sky, but the sky is perfect over here, right? So we take these two and we put them together. And we get this. 
And this is the foreground image, and that is the sky image. And how did we do that? Well, um, first, I'm going to talk about this for a second. There's a whole bunch of things that happen during the night that are really annoying, and they include, you know, plane trails, satellites. We have we saw a lot of the the Starlink satellites going up during this trip, uh, space junk, which we have seen. We've seen rockets re-entering, and meteors, which I gave a little frowny face on because I actually like meteors. You can put them back in. When you stitch, you're not going to see those things because the stitching software is going to eliminate them automatically. So thumbs up on that one. But back to the main story. So um, I have more information about uh, how we stitch this together coming up, and we're going to talk about that. First, I want to talk about how many frames you shoot. You definitely, definitely want to... Um, let me see if I got anything going on here in the chat. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. There we go. Okay, cool. So how many frames do you, do you shoot? You definitely want to overshoot this. You want to shoot beyond on either side and beyond on top and bottom. It's really important to do that uh, because the panorama software is going to sometimes bend or manipulate depending on which projection you use. And you might not have, end up having to crop something that you really love. And since you're taking the time to be there, why not take a little extra time to shoot extra pictures so you don't miss those critical things that make the picture what you want it to be. Uh, so let's take a look at what that means. Here's a shot of Arch Rock and Joshua Tree. And this, I showed you the white edges all the way around it because I wanted you to see how much I overshot this image on purpose. There's a whole bunch of stuff over here that's disadvantageous, and this rock is kind of boring, right? So uh, I knew that I needed to get this top part in on the Milky Way. I knew I was just going to squeak it in. Uh, so my final crop was this. And you'd never know from that final crop that all this other stuff was going on, but it was absolutely necessary to get this final image. And this is important. And I love this little moment down here. <laughs> that gives you a sense of scale. So don't always ask people to get out of your frame because sometimes you can have a wonderful moment like that of knowing just how big something is. So we have this beautiful sweep coming over here. It is ending up in uh, and starting in light pollution, but that's Joshua Tree for you. So, uh, but it was a moonless night and we got all the Milky Way in there, and it fills the frame. And I'm really happy with that one. So when we're talking about overshooting it, we also have to talk about how many images to shoot. My strong recommendation is always overlap 50%. Just overlap 50%. That's it. That's the beginning and the end of the story. There are nuances to this. Um, but... This is my my favorite thing. So for super wide lenses, it's really essential because there's so much um, aberration going on because it's bending images. It's as uh, rectilinear as your lens can be, it's still bending the image. Definitely have a 50% overlap. I do say that everything else could be 20 to 50% here. But you know what? Honestly, the more overlap, the better. And if you're there, just overshoot it. Just overshoot it. You can always drop frames if they're not <clears throat> helping you stitch, but I've never ran into a situation where too many frames prevented a good stitch. So let's talk about this more. Why? Why am I recommending 50%? Because if you look at this, the image area is this box, right? This is our entire image area. And I drew it better that way. When you stitch your piano, it's only going to use the center area. Look at that, my terrible drawing. But it's only use that center area when you stitch together. And let's see what that means. Well, if we're doing a single row, this is the 50% overlap. And the green areas in the center are what's going to be used by the pano software to stitch together. And there's your final crop. So you don't need to worry about what's happening at the corners, like vignetting. Not so much if you do a 50% overlap. You don't have to worry about coma and the things that you don't like that happen at the corners. I promised I'd get back to that, right? As long as the center of your lens is sharp, if you're in focus, then you're going to be using the sweet spot of your lens all the way through to make this happen. And this is the same for multi-rows also. You see all of this overlap that happens in here? 
So between the two layers that you have, uh, or the three layers, you're going to have 50% overlap from the first row to the second row, and 50% overlap on every image. And you're going to have a sweet, well-rendered, very sharp pano. And there's your final crop inside of that area. So you want to overshoot, and you want to overlap 50%. It's going to help a lot. Now I'm going to take, and here we go. Here's your your triple row, right? And just to show it again, there's your crop on a triple row. And this is pretty much the same aspect ratio when you're looking at this as taking a single image, except it's like 40 some images, right? So uh, yeah, overshoot it, overlap 50%. There's a lot of information uh, about the coverage and I'm just gonna stop for a second. I saw that there was a, a question uh, from David. What if you want spot on stars, but for a longer exposure? That's a really interesting question, David. Uh, obviously, you've, uh, you said you have you knew about deepscapes also. Yes, deepscapes are a different thing. Um, that's extreme focal lengths uh, at the edge of the earth. Uh, but anyway, if you want spot on stars, but for a longer exposure, you have a couple of options, um, primarily including star trackers. Uh, but star tracker panos is a separate topic that I'm not covering today. Um, if you want to do longer exposures, you can just use the default instead of the accurate, and that's going to get you good. If that's still not bright enough, which in most cases usually is for me, um, then you should then try the 400 rule, which is uh, 400 divided by your focal length. And that uh, the resulting number is the maximum number of seconds you would use. Uh, and we can post that up. Back to the show. All right. So inside, um, let's see if I have this here, handouts. I'm going to make this available to you guys. Share. So I just made available the the user manual for the, the VR system Slim, which is what I've been using. Uh, that's where these charts come from in here. I'm going to turn my drawing back on. There we go. That's where these charts come from. So now you guys can grab your own copy of those. But let's start and talk about the important things you should do. Please test all your focal lengths during the daylight. At night, it's much harder to see things, right? Uh, go out and shoot some panos and process them before you go back out at night so that you're familiar with this, right? Using this chart you're gonna be able to find easy coverage. I already told you 50%. You can do that very simply by looking through your lens, finding an object on one side of your frame and then turning it until it's a third a third in and a third in on the other side. If you just keep doing that, then you're, you can look down at the scale and see how many degrees that was, and that's 50%. There's a math way to do it too that I'm gonna cover soon, but you can always, in a pinch, just do it visually. Um, so you can write it down in your notes, and I'm going to show you this. I took extensive notes, and it made my life so easy while I was out there. Uh, we already talked about don't worry about the corners or stopping down or coma. Shoot fast, wide open, uh, and don't have to worry about managing that coma. So here's the coverage I was talking about. You have in photo pills, you have the field of view pill. And if you set it to portrait, you see that there. Uh, then you're going to see for my camera, the Nikon Z6 at 15 millimeters, I have, I covered it up there, 77 degrees horizontal angle of view. So if you just divide your horizontal angle of view by two, then you're going to see, you know, I have 38.55 degrees of coverage, right? So I look in this chart over here and I see if I set the lever at 30 and then it's going to be 36 degrees, which is a little bit less than what I was looking for. So it's three clicks on the 30 setting, and I've got my 50% coverage. And it's that easy. So I just write that down. I say for my 15 millimeter lens, set the lever to 30 and do three clicks. And I've got my 50% coverage. And I never need to think about it again. So I just come over here and I set this guy to 30 here. And then I go one, two, three. And that's exactly half of the field of view that I need for the 15 millimeter lens that I have on here. All right. So here's an example. Um, 
this is basically a square. It's a three by three grid, right? So I took three images across, three images across, three images across, and this is the result. And I got this really cool Milky Way coming down into uh, that part of the white pocket. But then I shot a five by three because I thought the aspect ratio would be better and I was right. So uh, planning out your grid is gonna be really important uh, to help you with. And we, the, I don't think I put a lot of information in this about lighting, but I just wanna say, and you'll see some other examples of lighting in here. This was lit with two LED panels set to 1% or less, probably 0.2% in some cases. And they're just coming in from very far away on the left. And then there's one back here that's very dim. And actually it was bouncing into this rock uh, on the other side and reflecting on that. So this is in pure darkness and it's just a drip, drip, drip of light. Um, and if you use a, a low level lighting technique, you can then create beautiful shadows in your foreground coming across like that. All right, uh, cool. So let's talk about choosing lenses. Short answer, all of them work. You could use any lens that you want to make a pano. In fact, extra wide to extra long, you can make all sorts of panos that way. And it's just going to increase or decrease how the subject relates. Much like say, taking a single picture, more compression with a telephoto lens and distant objects get smaller with a wider lens, right? Uh, so if I want more sky and foreground, naturally, I'm going to use a wider lens because it's vertical, so I can get more of this and more of that. Um, if you want more detail, I showed you that image from the Grand Canyon earlier. You're going to zoom in like a 70 millimeter and then make a grid out of that. Um, for single rows, I have been shot probably most of the time during this last trip at 24 millimeters vertical. That seemed really comfortable for me. And I love my 24 to 70 S lens for the Nikon Z. It focuses very quickly and it made everything a snap. Uh, for multiple rows, it really depends. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how much foreground you have and how close the objects are in the foreground and how much you wanna go right to left. So let's jump in and look at some of those examples. Um, after this, now we have to talk about the elephant in the room. What is this nodal point thing? Well, it's called many things. Um, the entrance pupil, the nodal point, the optical center, um, eliminating parallax. What it really is, is when there's an object that's uh, in the foreground and an object that's distant, if you pan your lens beyond them and one of them moves while you're panning your lens beyond, you have parallax. And eliminating parallax is making sure that as you rotate your camera back and forth like this, that this is set up at the appropriate distance to eliminate parallax uh, so that you have adjusted for the entrance pupil. And I can show you some stuff about this. So if you have foreground elements, you just have to adjust for it. There's no way around it. You're gonna ruin your stitch or have a very, very bad stitch if you don't adjust for parallax. Um, if your foreground is distant and you have a wide angle lens, chances are you don't have to do this. I just got into the habit of always doing it because as soon as I had this rig, it was always simple. And it was the thing that was always on my tripod. So um, it was a matter of seconds for me to set it to the right thing and be done with it. So that's talking about convenience right there. Um, and the notes part helps a lot too. And I think that's in an upcoming slide here. Oh, there it is. I was in my hotel room and I said, I never want to measure nodal point again. So what I did was I used this wall right here and that lock, and I'm gonna show you a video, but I used that wall and that lock to test the, the nodal point settings. And I just copied this chart in here into the notes on my phone. And then I would just say for my 11 millimeter Cine lens, I would set it to you know this part on the rail and I actually took pictures so I could see that number also. Um, and then I could say also how many clicks that I needed too. So I just, I wrote it down ahead of time, put in my notes so I could pop this up on my phone when I switched lenses and never have to think about it again. Do yourself a favor, write it down in a place that's uh, accessible and do it during the daytime. So I'm just gonna use this as an example. This subject is very close. There's a Joshua tree and there's my camera. 
very close. That's like three, four, three feet, four feet. Uh, so I absolutely have to do parallax adjustment. This is with the 11 millimeter lens vertically, and this is eight frames. If I had not adjusted for the nodal point, I would have had real serious trouble stitching these parts because they wouldn't meet up with the background very well. And it would have looked really ugly and it probably like been a terrible stitch, but I did just for a nodal point. Uh, and this is the, the series of images. Uh, and you can see that even with the nodal point adjustment, it still bends. It's still an 11 millimeter lens. It still bends at the images, at the edges. But this is a 50% overlap or sometimes a little bit more because I wanted the stitch to work. Now here's what it is. Instead of 11, we got 24 millimeters. I've more than doubled my focal length. And because I did that, I had to do three rows and 44 frames. Big difference between the two. Uh, so that's how many pictures it took to get to that. And this is the two side by side. And now you can see it compressed a lot. Now you can play with your projection when you're assembling these, but it compresses it a lot. What I do want to point out is look at the size of the mountain back here and the size of the mountain back here. Um, and this is just basic photography, right? If you want distant objects to appear smaller, use a wider lens. If you want them to appear larger, use a longer lens. And that's what I liked about this one. And I actually find this one more pleasing as a piano. Um, although the sky in this one has some really interesting things going on. So it's a lot more work though, to do a triple row versus a single row. So you need to balance those things as you're looking through it. So let's take a look at what I mean. I just want to show you a little bit more of this parallax. Um, this is here in my studio. I wanted to show you guys. Looking on the, the right-hand side, you'll see me operating um, the camera and then adjusting forwards and backwards. On the left-hand side, just notice the area between the door frame and the bright window, how it now it's coming in and out and it's disappearing. That's parallax. And as I make the adjustment, it starts to disappear less. And at some point, moving the camera forwards and back towards the rail, it's reduced to the point where it doesn't change at all. And that's what I'm talking about with parallax adjustments. As soon as you find that magic spot where the difference between the door frame edge and the window behind it in the center of the frame doesn't change, I just note that number and I'm done. And that's and that's what it is. So when I find that special number, there's there's a, a rating up here, and I just slide this back and forth. I set this to exactly where it should be, and I never have to measure it again once I've found that nodal point. And I just do that for every single lens that I own and put it in my notes, and I'm done. So I hope that helps. I know when I first approached learning about nodal points, it was quite confusing. I hope that my approach to explaining it helps you. Next up, so you also need to calibrate uh, for making sure that your your lens is dead center on the VR system slim or whatever you're gonna be using. Uh, I happen to love this product a lot. So it's really simple. Uh, your camera needs to be horizontally and vertically adjusted. Um, and it's, it's really simple to do because you have those large blue knobs uh, to move this in and out. And I can show you a quick video on that. So let's play this video so you can see what it looks like. Um, this is me setting up. Uh, out in Joshua Tree, I'm going to jump ahead. So I, I turn the camera vertically, and what I'm doing is I'm just turning on video, and I am focusing on, uh, I'm using the center focus dot to put it exactly in the middle, and there's a bubble level there. And then up top, I'm moving it left and right to make sure that it's in exactly the same place. Now you can do this on the tripod, or you can do it off the tripod. In this case, Mine is permanently affixed to it. I took the quick release plate off because I just mounted it right to the, the balancing, the leveling head that I have, the MBAL 20. Uh, and it's just perfectly in place. Uh, so here we go. Um, yeah. So once it's done, I would just set that to the nodal point that I need. 
and I'm off to the races. I'm ready to shoot now, and everything is tech tech sharp. Um, this is an example of me taking it off of the tripod and just doing it. You can look through the lens and do it, and there's another shot when I'm doing it at night, and I'm just moving it to the exact center. And I'm making a big deal out of this. It's actually the easiest part of the whole process. It's just making sure that everything's centered. And I wanted to show you how simple it is to calibrate uh, for different lenses. Because when you have a different foot on your camera, uh, it's going to look different. Uh, so it, let's say I have my 11 millimeter Cine. It has a foot on the bottom of it that pushes it out some. So I need to adjust for that. Or my 70 to 200 also has a foot on it. So if you're just using the L bracket on your camera, then chances are you're not going to need to do that very often. All right, back into it. Now, when you're shooting uh, night photography, you're generally shooting at very shallow apertures, f2.8, f4 maybe. Um, and that means that you're likely not going to have everything in focus. So when I have an, a foreground subject, I almost always have to make two passes with a pano, one where I'm focused for the foreground and one where I'm focused for the stars. Uh, usually when I set up, I arrive right when uh, the Milky Way should be in exactly the right place. Of course, this is a daytime shot I'm showing you here, um, but let's say it was over here and I knew it was arcing over to the right place over here. I would start shooting the sky immediately. I would not work on the foreground, not yet, not until I've nailed the sky. So work on your skies first, if the Milky Way is in the right place, uh, and then come back and do a second pass for the sky. So uh, going back to that example of the toadstools that I showed you before, this top row is where I focused on the sky. And I didn't care about what happened in the foreground. In the foreground, I didn't care what happened in the sky. Uh, so in the sky focus, I did very careful focus on the stars and then I did my pano stitch across, right? And then for this one, I did a very careful focus on the foreground, and then I did my pano stitch across. Also, you're going to you're going to stitch these separately. So I process the sky to make each image in the sky look beautiful, and then I stitch them all together. And then I process this one for the foreground, so the foreground looks good. Don't care about the sky. And then I stitched all these together. And then what happened next was this. Uh, so this is the foreground focus row stitched. But if you zoomed in, you would see that the skies are unacceptably soft. And then this is the sky focus row. And you'll notice that the foreground is blown out. I would never process like that for the foreground. But the sky is done perfectly, or what I believe to be perfectly, right? So I stitched this. And then separately, you load them both into Photoshop as two separate layers. And then you're going to go into um, Edit, Auto Align. And then you just use Auto. And then it's going to stack them over each other as best as it can. And you're just going to crop off the rest of this. And then on the foreground layer, you're going to add a layer mask. And you're just going to mask out everything that's in the sky. And once that's gone, you turn on the layer below it, which is the sky. And now you have a layered panel blend where you have the ground as one layer and the sky as a second layer. And they're just blended together. And you would flatten this and save it off. And now you have a magical panel where everything from the foreground to infinity is in focus. And it just took a little bit of extra effort but you end up with a masterpiece photo, uh, which if you only focus on the sky, the foreground would look unacceptably unsharp. Make sense? Good. Uh, another example. Um, this is 12 images wide. So we have 12 images going this way. Beep. All right. And then we have three rows here. So I've got this grid. And excuse me, I'm drawing with a mouse. It sound, it looks terrible, but it's it works out. So this was a fun one to work on and a little more complicated, and I'll walk you through it. I used a 70 millimeter lens vertically, and I wanted to have all this Grand Canyon detail in there. Um, 
on the top, and you'll have to excuse this, we saw before in the previous slide that this is 12 wide, right? So just a little example. So this is 12 wide, and this is by one, right? So the, the top row is 12 by one, and I took for each of these images, I took five images. And then you can do that here and here and here and here, 12 across, like that. And I did that because I star point stacked those images, which means you take them into a separate piece of software. For Mac, it's called Starry Landscape Stacker. Uh, for PC, it's called Sequator. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to write that with this mouse. S E Q U A T O R. So each of these images is optimized for star points by putting them into star landscape stacker. And then I stitched those single images into one row in Panorama Studio Pro 3, uh, which I find to be most of the time superior to Lightroom and Photoshop. Uh, and then on the bottom, each of these images, this is two rows, so let's split this in half, right? Each of these rows was 60 seconds long instead of the MPF, which was probably six seconds. So I had six times six images, five images at six seconds a piece, star point stacked. And then down here, each of these was 60 seconds long because they had this beautiful moonlight coming in here that I wanted to capture. And these were at F2.8 ISO 6400. <clears throat> now I stitched together these two separately in Panorama Studio Pro. And the next thing that happened was I had to align and blend these in Photoshop, which you could see a close up of here, right? Uh, and I had to blend these carefully on the edges there. <clears throat> and then these two got combined together. And this is why I did it at 70 millimeters. I would have never gotten this resolution at a wider angle lens. See the detail I'm getting from the moonlight crossing through in here. And this is 100% uh, look in Lightroom Classic. And this is where the blend happens. Uh, and this is another 100. And you can see they've got these really sharp stars that blend really well uh, into this uh, cloud line right here. And it ended up being pretty darn successful. I'm really happy. I have to go back and edit it some more because it's, it's not exactly the way I want it, but it's pretty darn close now. Uh, but that's 12 images wide by three rows tall. Uh, so it's a lot of images. All right, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, you have to use stuff to make these images, right? So we'll talk about the gear. I'm going to talk about what I liked using. Um, if you guys want to talk gear, uh, we're going to have another webinar uh, coming up in about two weeks from today, uh, where uh, Martin is going to cover this and I'll help him out. I just put the link in the chat. Um, if you want to go over all the panoramic solutions that NovaFlex has, that's a great opportunity. Uh, right now, I'm going to limit what I'm talking about to what I know, and that's this wonderful piece of gear. Give me a second. Been talking for an hour. I'm a little dry here. Okay. So starting off, um, if you're doing a single row pano, the bare minimum that you need is a rock solid tripod, a leveling base, a uh, ball head with a panning base, uh, an L bracket, and possibly a nodal adjustment rail. What you might not need is a leveling base, maybe. I mean, because the ball head can be used to level it out. The important thing is that your panning be below the ball head. Um, but what you really want is for the panning to be level. If your panning is not level, then you're not going to get a good panel stitch. Your horizon is going to be at an angle and it's going to look terrible. So I do recommend having tripod, leveling head, ball head as bare minimum for what you're going to use for a single row pano. If you have foreground elements, you should use a nodal rail. Your nodal rail could be a quote unquote nodal rail, right? Uh, or it could be a focusing rack if you have that for macro. That works the same way. All it's doing is offsetting your camera backwards so that you can find that um, that point that you need to find. Uh, or it could be a, a long quick release plate that you attach to the camera and it just sets it back some. What you need to do is not attach it directly to the ball head if you have foreground elements. Again, 
if you're super wide and there's no fore foreground elements, chances are you don't need that parallax adjustment and you can avoid it altogether. Uh, but it's really interesting to have foreground elements and I'd say almost essential. Uh, so I'd say just go for it and get yourself a, a setup where you are nodally adjusted. I shot all my single row panos with this kit uh, the entire time I was out. Uh, I ended up not going the ball head route uh, because this is just easy. It's just, it's easy to use. I'll gush about it in a second. Um, okay. So if you wanted to do multi-row panos, ta -da, this is what you should be using. I'm going to turn off the clicks here. This is, um, this is the VR system slim. Uh, and it's extremely lightweight. It fits right inside my backpack. Um, I've seen a bunch of these systems over my career and I've never seen one so compact and easy to use. Um, it, it worked in every single situation I have. Everything else is the same. Uh, rock solid tripod. And in this case, I, I didn't talk about it in the last slide. I brought two, the TrioPod M from NovaFlex uh, or the TrioPod Pro 75. I used both of them throughout the trip. And depending on uh, how heavy the lens was or whether it was a ton of wind, you know, uh, I would use uh, the lighter one most of the time and the heavier one sometimes. So, and the balancing head that I have on here right now, this is the Mbell 20. And it says 20 because it can go 20 degrees in any direction. So I can level out just like that. And attached directly to the top of that is the VR System Slim, which has the click detents. I'm going to pull this away a little bit here, right? And it also has the ability to pack up really tiny. Uh, and I'll just take the camera off really quickly. And then this is it. This is light. And you can even pack it up even further. Um, yeah. And take this apart. And that's how tiny it gets. And it's just remarkably tiny for, for what it, the value that it provides is extraordinary. Uh, so uh, we'll start plopping in some links if you guys are curious as to, you know, where you can find out more information about the gear. Um, so the ball head in this case, I stopped using. Um, you could, if you have a, a leveling head and you use your tripod legs to adjust for uneven terrain, I don't think you need a ball head in between your tripod leveling head and this. It's just, it's unnecessary. And it makes this actually extremely light, lightweight to carry around and compact too. Uh, so I don't believe that's necessary. The, the L bracket is just an absolute necessity uh, to go vertical all the time. Otherwise, you're attaching the camera this way and you're going horizontal, which is vertoramas, which we're going to talk about next. In fact, there it is. So for vertoramas, if you have a ball head that you can invert, so you put what's normally the top plate on the bottom, and then you turn it to the side so that the panning base is where you connect the camera, you can do option A that I have here. Then you can just use the panning base to turn your camera up and down like this to take your vertoramas. And that's really what you want to do. Um, so if you do that and you L-bracket it to the side, that's one way to do it. The other way you can do it is by uh, switching this around. And I have the, the picture there where I Photoshopped all the, the angles together, but basically you just flip this around the other way. And now you can use this to operate your vertorama. So you would set it here, take a picture, set it here, take a picture, and so on and so forth. So that you can get your vertorama in. And this is nodally adjusted. Option A is not nodally adjusted. So, all right. So we've, we've come a long way today, folks. Um, it's a big topic. And I think that we did a pretty good job of talking about this in an hour. Um, so uh, I'm just going to recap really quick, and then we're going to dive right into all of your questions. I see the red dot. I know that you guys have been really good in the chat there. Uh, so to recap, why would you want to do panoramas? Resolution, resolution, resolution. You want more detail, and especially with the Milky Way, there's a lot of detail to be had. I like to lose myself in the dust channels. It's a beautiful and wonderful experience. When do you want to do it? Generally, when the core of the Milky Way is up. Don't limit yourself. Don't say, I'm never going to take a, a panorama unless the Milky Way core is up, because then you're losing a lot of the night. 
uh, but it is an ideal situation and that's great right now, right? How I say exposure duration should be for NPF, which is the longest possible exposure with, without the stars starting to trail a little bit. Um, if you use the 400 rule or the 500 rule, they're going to trail a little bit. So stick to NPF and you should be good. Uh, how many rows? Single when it fits, double or triple when it doesn't, right? Start with the lenses you have. Uh, they're probably going to be great. And something I didn't mention is, like, obviously, I'm not using the highest resolution camera available. The Z7 would be higher resolution than this. The Z6 happens to have an incredible balance of high ISO performance and quality at 24 megapixels. The more megapixels you have, the more problems you have with high ISO noise and quality at high ISOs. Conversely, if you have an APS-C sensor instead of full frame, you can get, you can emulate having more resolution on your sensor by taking panos. So your APS-C size sensor camera, you can make these extraordinarily detailed pictures by making mosaics or panoramas and increase uh, the effective usability of your camera. Um, overshoot it, always overshoot around the edges of what you wanna shoot so you can crop it later. It's worth the extra time. Shoot your sky and your foreground separately if you need to focus on the foreground and then blend them. And then, I, I can't stress it enough, having the right gear made everything possible. I have never shot this many panos on a trip and I was out for three weeks and I have, I have a folder full of pano images that I can't wait to print. And it was all because I could set up and be ready to shoot in less than a minute. And I can't say that about anything else I've ever tried. I was traveling with Gabe Biederman and Gabe called me the pano monster while I was on this trip because I just kept banging out the panos over and over. And I could be done sometimes with a pano before other people were done with a single image. And it just having the right gear allows you to focus on creating instead of thinking about how to use the thing that's in your hands. So uh, the VR system slim is something uh, that worked out really well for me. So um, yes. So that's that's what I, I got to say. I love it. I have to thank Martin uh, Grawl, who's here in the chat. Before I left on my trip, Martin and I hopped on Instagram Live, and I said, I want to make panos. What should I use? And Martin suggested the VR system slim to me. And uh, it's not going back. I'm buying this. I'm keeping it. It's mine. There's no way anybody's getting this one because it made my life better. And I've, uh, I love panos before. I absolutely love them now. Uh, so that's that. Um, yeah, we're going to take questions now. I just want to say I'm going to pop these in there too. Uh, if you're not familiar with me, uh, my my personal work, you can see more of that at matthillart.com. And I'm going to make sure that there's spaces in there, right? Um, and if you wanted to learn more about uh, night photography, I do teach workshops with my partners at National Parks at Night. Um, and I'm posting those right now. And there's that. So now I'm going to pop into uh, the Q&A and see what's going on. So let's see what's new here. All right. So what if you want spot on stars but for a longer exposure? David, we answered that one. Um, so we got that. And that's good. So John Bianchi asked this. Are there special techniques for light painting for a pano? I love that question. All right. So um, let me bring up just my video here. So John asks, are there special techniques for light painting for a pano? Yeah. Um, the low level lighting is one of my, my favorite things to do. And what that really means is taking uh, a dim LED and placing it strategically. Um, there was an image in here where you actually saw the two light sources in it because I covered more than 180 degrees. Um, I've, I do that strategically. I place them behind something so you can't see them, like behind a tree. I've also tried bouncing the light off of something behind me or even crossing lights behind me so that it, it's reflected light coming out onto the scene. It's not ideal because it doesn't create as much texture and depth, uh, but it did work in that one... 11 millimeter pano shot uh, at white pocket of the vortex. Um, that worked out really well. It didn't quite light the vortex, but it was supposed to be deep in there. Um, if you wanted to light paint 
multiple frames, you could run in and light paint each frame separately. You just don't want to let too much time elapse in between frames because then the stars are moving in a certain direction and you don't want to cause overlap and other things like that. I would recommend stationary lighting, the low level lighting instead. Um, I'm going to, let's see. This is one of my favorites here. I'm just going to turn it off so it doesn't blind me. Uh, this is the Luxley Fiddle. Uh, this device, this LED panel, uh, comes with, uh, you can get it with the diffuser, goes down to 0.1%. Um, and it's really, really helpful for night photography, especially, especially because you can control it with your phone. So if you're, it's out in the scene, 30, 60 feet away, you can pull it up on the phone and then you can, um, reduce it down to 0.1 or 0.2%. And it's really helpful because, on these long exposures at high ISO, you just need a little drip of light. A little drip, drip, drip fills up the bucket over 20 seconds. Uh, I hope that's helpful, John. Uh huh. So let's see what we have next. Uh, all right. Chuck asks, how do you deal with the movement of stars between your first image and your last image in a pano, which could have been taken several minutes apart? Okay. Um, I did cover this. Uh, and you might have asked this a while back, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it again um, because it's really helpful. I would take separate images for the stars versus the foreground and blend those two images together. That way you can mitigate the issues uh, that you have. Uh, several minutes is too long, in my opinion, because, you know, it's moving around you know, this way during the night. So uh, in the northern hemisphere. Um, so I would take a bunch of shorter images first for the sky. And once you've nailed that and you've reviewed it and you've checked to make sure everything's sharp in your camera, then work on your landscape images separately, which will take longer per, and you might even turn on, and I didn't mention this, shame on me. You might turn on long exposure noise reduction for your ground images, your landscape images to reduce the amount of hot pixel noise you get. Um, that's a possibility you might decrease your ISO to increase the quality. But I, I recommend keeping them kind of close together uh, unless you're star point stacking for up top, which is going to take a 6400 image and make it look like an 800 ISO image. Then you could probably shoot your foreground at 800 ISO. <clears throat> if if you know that your relative quality is going to be the same. Pardon me. So that's how I would, I would mitigate that, Chuck. Uh, John asks, if you shoot a 12-photo row at 60 seconds per shot, how do you adjust for star moment? Same same answer, John. Um, I would shoot the stars separately, and I wouldn't shoot the stars at, stars at 60 seconds unless you're using a star tracker. And that's a completely different presentation. Um, all right. So those are all of the, the Q&A images that I saw. Um, all right. So let's see. All right. So Suzanne asked this. Can you address the mechanics of how to manipulate your tripod head smoothly while keeping it level? Yeah. In this case, keeping the leveling separate. Um, if you keep the leveling separate below this, and honestly, you don't use a tripod head. You use uh, uh, something like the VR System Slim. Uh, then you won't have to worry about keeping anything level because everything above this point is dead level once you've leveled it. There's a bubble level on top of this that makes you uh, confident that you're in the right place. All right, what else? That's a VR system slim. All right, cool. Do we have a new one coming in here? Are there click stops for 50% overlap on vertical? Uh, yes, Martin. Um, Michael, sorry. There are click stops for... Let's see. I got to look at it here. I have this all written down. So um, there are click stops. The lever for 16, 30. The 16 is 22 and a half degrees. 30 is for 12 degrees. 36 is for 10 degrees. And 48 is for seven and a half degrees. So this is 48, which means 48 clicks per revolution. And that's seven and a half degrees, right? This is 36, so that's 10 degrees. So you're going to have 36 images around 
and a circle. This is 30, which is 12 degrees, right? And this is 16 degrees, which is 22 and a half per. Now, if you look at the, the chart that we had, and I guess I can, I'm going to show my desktop again. Uh, I'll show my desktop, which I haven't done yet. You guys are going to get to see more of my stuff. All right. So I'm just looking. This is my nodal points. I told you I took notes on this. This is my nodal points thing here, right? So we have uh, 16. If you do two clicks at 22 and a half, it's 45 degrees. So that would be uh, you just do the math for your horizontal field of view. Uh, divide that in two and look for the closest setting in this chart. And you can do that um, over there to answer the, the question that we we're talking about. Um, to get 50%, you're just going to have to do a little bit of math, get that horizontal field of view out of photo pills, and then come over here. Or you can use this chart here, which say I have uh, a 15 millimeter. So I have full, full frame, 14 to 21. Uh, the increment is uh, 45, so I would set it to 16 in two clicks. So that's what this chart is, and that's why I made that available for you guys to download in the chat uh, over in the handouts. Great. So let's see what we have. Um, Answer, publish, chat. All right. Perfect. All right. So, um, all right. Well, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to just hit reply to any of the emails you got about this webinar. If you're watching this on the replay, uh, please leave a question down in the comments uh, and we will get back to you. Uh, and we really appreciate you being here. Um, I just want to reiterate that we are going to have another webinar shortly uh, in two weeks. And I'm going to post it up again because I think the first time I posted it that... It got a little messed up because there wasn't a space between the link and the word. So Martin's going to be hosting how to choose the right panoramic solution from NovaFlex. You guys can sign up for that today and be the first ones to get in line. There are a lot of piano rigs uh, and balancing heads uh, that NovaFlex makes. I chose the VR System Slim because, gosh, I had to carry a lot of stuff around for three weeks. Uh, and I had to carry this along with a lot of other things, and I needed it to be uh, size and weight efficient. It worked for every single lens that I own. That doesn't mean that you have the same needs that I do, and there are more robust solutions with different features that you might want to consider. So I suggest uh, checking it out, uh, signing up for that one, and letting, uh, letting uh, Martin know if you have questions about those things. If you want to know anything about that ahead of time, uh, we have some other things. I didn't open up all of these. Uh, I'm going to open up a couple more polls to you guys. Uh, over on the side, there were some things there. Um, if you would like help choosing some gear, just let us know in that poll what you would want to know. We'll make sure that Martin covers that uh, when we have that in two weeks. Uh, for... For the rest of this, I just want to say you guys hung out with me for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I am so grateful. You guys are awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm going to go look through the chat now because I didn't get to see much of it. I was so focused on delivering the information to you. I need to give a big shout out to Martin Grawl. Thank you for speaking with everybody while I was presenting, Martin. Thanks for all the helpful links and the customer care that you provided. And thanks to Brenda Hipsher for all of our support. Uh, we are NovaFlex USA and Martin's from NovaFlex International. Um, I'll see you guys next time. Uh, and, uh, thanks a lot. Go seize the night and take care of yourselves.